thank you for having me here. It's really a pleasure for me to be back in South Africa after I've spent uh, a good amount of my first two years in Africa here um, to help get the South Africa uh, research lab of IBM Research in Africa started. Um, and um, it's a great privilege for me to be here, especially when I see you know, what's happening here at CSIR. And I just want to start with this. It's, it's really amazing for me to see. And you know, I think we're very, very fortunate here with you know, Solomon, who's the lab director for the South Africa setup. Uh, with partners like Barry and, and partners from CSIR to, to engage uh, in depth in trying to make a difference uh, through science and technology. Now, um, <coughs> as you will see, I don't have any slides. I want to give you a little bit of background why. It's not because I'm so terribly busy and lazy. It's uh, because uh, when I started the setup in Nairobi, I introduced a policy with my team members, which was no charts. Because in charts, everything works great, right? Big data is not a problem, and artificial intelligence is not a problem, nothing is a problem. So I figured, let me try to remove charts, and of course, leading by example means that I kind of completely fell out of the habit of <laughs> making charts. But the dynamics in my team has changed because what they have to do is they prepare a write-up, and then you know we come together and we talk and try to solve the actual problem that we have at hand. So I apologize for this for those who need charts, but I'll try to do my best to bring my point across, and my point might be a slightly different view on big data than you may have heard it before, so uh, feel free to criticize me over it. Uh, I would enjoy that. Um, I was, you know, I have a five-year-old son, and I sometimes wonder about in 30 years from now, um, what kind of a conversation would I have with him in terms of you know the evolution of technology what are the kind of things that you know he will be worried about or he will be thinking about or maybe even working on and um, one of the things that I always hope to say is that in 30 years from now I can say that with all the artificial intelligence and learning and thinking machines around that we may discuss from both of a dystopian view meaning the government has been very lenient on putting in policies on how to use thinking machines um, to what huge societal impact these machines have had over the last whatever years they were um, that I could say you know I was there when it all began that would be a cool thing to say. Right? I always wanted to talk about my past and all that, right? Now I'm actually getting into a point where, you know, I have my professional career after my PhD, it's been 15 years, and, you know, things in IT change a lot in 15 years. But big data started really quite a while back. So let me step back a little bit and think about how did we come to this point that we're talking about all this data stuff, right? It's actually an interesting transition in IT because traditionally in the era of programmable systems, what we did is we used computers to make processes more efficient. And then the industry jumped on things like business process reengineering to cut the slack out of manufacturing, to make systems and, and processes and work processes how we as humans work more efficient. But then something interesting happened, which of course was partly the internet, but the internet started out by essentially democratizing us as users to contribute content, predominantly static content, um, to a worldwide connected net. In the early 2000s, something really interesting happened, which was based on older ideas uh, that existed for you know, a couple of decades. We said, well, w we could also just invoke services over the internet. And we could make content really much more dynamic. And at the same time, very nascent at that point, you know, cell phones were starting to come up as well. And at some point, the industry was saying, well, if everything on the internet is a resource, why should it only be text-based content? It could also be a machine that could be a resource. And that was sort of the, 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 the initial thought around what is now cloud computing. And what has cloud computing done? Well, the dynamic content and through API invocation kind of created sort of a self-similar systems. Now I can access 
IT resources over the internet, but I can also deploy services over the internet that can co-create value because they all are connected via APIs. And if you look at the API economy today, it's huge, right? And all of these entities are, are creating tremendous amount of data. And what's happening also, or what, what we probably didn't see coming in this way, or some people may have, is, is the pervasiveness of mobile devices. And mobile devices is something which is, which is conceptually very different from the usual form factors of, of an IT workstation because it allows you to access data and publish data anywhere you are, anywhere you want to go. And if you think about it, um, today it acts as a sensor and an actuator for anything you do. And what we probably also didn't realize is that how we as the human race are so happily willing to share whatever we think. We Twitter, we are openly on Facebook where we are right now, how nice it is here. We click pictures, we share small and large videos about everything. So there is a dynamic that started by just thinking one thought, which was, well, what if I could just access any kind of resources over the internet and it's it, it span off this incredible situation that we are in. Now, here's the interesting thought that um, dawns on me, in fact, almost every day. Uh, the, you know, Barry and Quentin actually made uh, two comments which were uh, sort of going towards the point of, do we actually still have control? Now, I want to make a radical statement, which is the machines that we think in 20 years from now we will have that discussion whether the machines are taking over and artificial intelligence is dominating and all that. The machines have already taken over. They have already taken over. Now, when we joke about we can't deal with our email anymore or there are so many influences from social media and this and that that we expose ourselves to, the truth though is that the human capacity, the human brain, from an evolutionary perspective, has created a lot of these things, but the reality is nobody can manage this anymore. Think about it, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, a radiologist who would look at your x-rays maybe has 10 patients, there's a cost point aspect to it, how much does it actually cost, and you look at 10 images and you have sufficient time to apply expertise to come up with an insight from an unstructured piece of information to say you have this problem and this is what you have to do. Today the same radiologist looks through hundreds of images because you know MRIs and all that have come to a cost point and also have become a standard way of generating insights about you as a human being, about us as human beings, that the same radiologist is, is looking at so many pieces of information. Now can that, can we expect a human being to be as accurate as if you have all the time that you need with 100 images or more than 100 images a day? Ask yourself the question, I think it's not possible. I think our brains are not as evolved as we would like to think they are. Because also think about the arrogance of the medical professions. Right? That is an indication that in many ways we're actually fooling ourselves. Now, the, the interesting thing though about this is that, see, big data, let's go back again to 2001, 2002, when somebody came up with this idea that what characterizes big data is uh, three things. One is volume, terabytes of data coming from all over the place. The other one is velocity, real time, streams computing, this and that. The third one is, um, is the, the vo volume, velocity, see I'm, my, my brain is, huh? My friend, I thank you. <laughs> you read my speech, right? You, you found a way to connect. <laughs> yeah, variety. And I'm leaving out veracity, I'll come back to that later, but variety. So the, the, the different levels of unstructured data, to what extent is this a reality today? Uh, just think about the healthcare space again that I just mentioned to you. Today we estimate about 4,200 petabytes worth of data that make up, that are produced in the healthcare industry. Within the next two to three years, we expect it to double. 
Now, out of this amount that's going to come out, right, another 4,000 petabytes of data, we believe that about 90% of it is unstructured. It's again a huge shift, right? It's both the volume aspect of it, it's the variety aspect of it, but then it's also velocity. Now, let's bring velocity away from what we always talk about in terms of real time. I'm not so worried about real time. Because when you take all that massive amounts of data and you bring it down to what matters to you as an individual, it's not so much, but it has increased just enough to overwhelm the human brain. Just enough to overwhelm the human brain. Now let's look at the upside of it. Imagine the incredible amount of insights you can generate from all that data that's available if you now look across human beings, right? So you have medical imagery that can detect various different forms of cancer growth early in their faces. You can look at sonograms, you can look at all sorts of other things. And what's, what's really exciting about this though is that how, do we, how are we going to do this, right? I think the only way how we can benefit from it is that to outthink and to outperform the machines that are right now overwhelming us, we need to create machines that actually have the ability to understand what it is that we're producing, to be able to reason about it, and then at the end of the day also to learn from it. And why not also teach us to learn more about what we are actually producing. So for me, big data is, is, is a hint that we managed as a human society to completely outperform ourselves with the machines. Which is a great thought for me as a scientist, right? Because I couldn't think of anything better, right? The machines have already taken over. I just love it. Because here's the, here's the solution, or I don't know if it's a solution, right? But here's what we need to do, and I will make a case that especially here in Africa, there will not be anytime soon another option than creating thinking and learning machines to address some of the biggest societal issues that we have. And let me explain to you why I think this. So um, now I, I have a little bit of a uh, thing when, you know, every time I come to South Africa, uh, I always hear how South African talk about Africa, right, which is typically South Africa. And South Africa is a very unique society in all of Africa. Yes, you know, some problems are the same, but I can assure you that the majority of problems that I, for example, I live in Kenya, uh, compared to what I see here in South Africa, South Africa is for all practical purposes, um, you know, a pretty decent middle-income economy. And um, the viewpoints of South Africans about the rest of Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, remind me a lot about the viewpoints of Europeans about Sub-Saharan Africa. So I want to share with you a few examples from Sub-Saharan Africa and reason with you about why learning systems and cognitive systems, as we call them in IBM, uh, could be a very scary but a very effective solution to some significant societal issues. And I want to use two examples, one from the financial sector and one from healthcare. And I'll start with the financial sector one because that's kind of the less scary one. So um, <coughs> in sub-Saharan Africa and actually across the entire African country, and true also for many other developing regions, 80% of people don't have access to traditional financial services, which means um, they don't have a way to make payments, they don't have a way to, to have a bank account, um, and thereby also to accumulate savings in a, in a formal way uh, that then also allows you to, for example, request a loan. Now, what has happened is that um, there are now certain trends like M-Pesa in Kenya, which is a mobile payment platform uh, that essentially allows you to put cash up in, in an in ubiquitous agent and the agent will upload that as a value onto your phone and will always be there and you can send it to another phone number via USD channel, so via SMS. So that's a great invention unfortunately happens is at that, that extent it only works in Kenya, but, but what, what is the role of banks? So let's step back a little bit like centuries ago. What, what would 
banks actually do? What should they be doing? I mean, the, the banking system today has kind of morphed into this money-making machine, but this is not how banks started, right? The traditional services that a bank offers, actually four pillars, right? The four pillars are, the first one is um, to essentially connect borrowers and lenders. It's the first thing that a bank should do. They're, that's why they are called intermediaries. Right? The second thing is to worry about your personal financial planning. The third thing is to help you mitigate risks in case you get into trouble or also if you want to grow as an individual economically. And to do all of this, the fourth pillar is to provide a mechanism to automate or to provide a mechanism to uh, provide payments. Right, to a transactional view of how you move money across. Now, what I just said is all of the traditional banking system, even today, think about maybe your own life. If you want a credit somewhere, if you want a loan, you probably go to a bank. There's a person who will look at you, who will look at your assets, who will look at how much savings do you have, where do you work, what do you do, what are your prospects? If you want to take a loan, you want to pay it off for 20 years, the bank incurs a risk, but also a lot of gain because of the interest rates, which they will keep to essentially connect whatever somebody else put in towards what your request is. But it's a human loan assessor. And my view is that loan assessing, loan assessors are probably in human history one of the most successful human professions. If you think about it, if you think about how long banks have been around without ever getting disrupted and how significant uh, the amount of retail banking and how stable retail banking is even today. So transactional retail banking, by the way, was still growing through the last financial crisis, which was probably worse than the Great Depression. So, so here's the incredible leap of faith. If you want to do re retail banking, it incurs transaction costs, right? Because you have to set up a relationship center, you have to hire people, you have to make them aware of the community, they have to be part of the community. So every transaction that you do, no matter how low value it is, you incur a high transaction cost. When you look at the market, that we are targeting, 80% unbanked, those are people who live in the lowest and low income sector and of course people who live in abhorrent poverty. If I just look at the lowest income sector, which for example in India is about 80 to 90% of the population, in Kenya it's about the same. So these are people who live between 2 and 10 and maybe 10 to $20 um, a day of income. So when you do the calculation, they are perfectly okay to have disposable income to send their kids to school, uh, to buy a smartphone at current prices, etc., etc. So financially, they have disposable income. There is potential for growth, especially with the growing SME market in this space. But as a bank, you cannot afford to put up relationship centers everywhere in rural areas, in para-urban areas, and in many different areas where you cannot serve these customers effectively. So here's the incredible leap of faith that we do make today with the hype around mobile money. The leap of faith is that we can use the data that we get from call records, from mobile money payment records, from, from how you paid your financial bills and other areas, soft financial data as we call them, that we can build algorithms that perform as well or better than a human loan assessor. If I take it even another step forward, then I would say if we want to financially include not maybe all the 80% of excluded, but at least 20, 30, 40%. Our only way to do this today is to build cognitive systems that can assess you as a human being as well or better as a human being can do and provide you human services. Now, this is an area that the lab is working on uh, and has been engaged in for quite some time. We work with some financial services providers and telcos who, who try to realize this. And we know how hard it is to do this. But I think from a technology perspective, from an algorithmic perspective, it is possible. But you have to be careful because what's the downside of it, right? Machines will, even these learning machines will never be perfect. 
The downside of it is that if you have 10 million customers and you send and you, you give one a 10 percent of them a, um, a credit and they will default, you just put one million people into debt. One million people is a lot of people to be in debt, especially from the economic circumstances that they're coming from. So these machine learning algorithms and these thinking systems that we are trying to build have to be so good right, that they can also prevent and that they can adapt themselves to whatever the situation is in the economic system that they are applied to. My perspective, this will not take 30 years to be realized. This will probably take another few years where we will see the first examples where the big hypothesis that we can replace a human loan assessor through an artificial intelligence will become reality. The second example I want to give you is from the healthcare space. Now here um, we see a very interesting dynamic. Um, see the doctor to patient ratio in sub-Saharan Africa is abysmal uh, compared to what you see in mature markets. Um, also, high quality care doesn't exist at all. And I can assure you that from my own experience um, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's, um, um, I have the means to take my kid to a hospital in Germany where I grew up, um, but not every Kenyan has that same means, right? So, and uh, I'd rather prefer to do that because of the quality of care. Now, about this, we started to use our Watson system, which is um, a cognitive system, artificial intelligence system, to train it on in oncology. So we worked with some of the world's most proficient <coughs> cancer doctors in the United States, and we had this thought that there's so much data out there, so much knowledge out there. Um, in unstructured form, texts and scientific journals, etc., that do research around uh, cancer, and we never, we can never use them as human beings because even the most, most prolific readers amongst the doctors cannot read everything that's been published. So we ingested all that data into Watson, and we trained the system, and we trained the system to help the doctor to make a better assessment of what a cancer treatment should be, assuming that you've already diagnosed somebody with cancer. We will eventually move now also in brain cancer towards looking at whether we can diagnose cancer at the onset, where Watson is going to assist the doctors to do so. Now, how many oncologists are there in Kenya? Well, maybe 10? at most. So cancer is the fastest rising disease in, in, in all of Africa. Right? Non-communicable diseases are taking over the traditional uh, challenges of the continent, HIV, AIDS, malaria, and tuberculosis. Right? So we have a situation where we don't have the doctors to even predict early on what's going on with somebody. We don't have sufficient care, especially even in the fringes of urban environments in Africa. So my question is, what should I do? Should I wait until the economic system will take care of that problem? Or should I bet on artificial intelligence system that may not be as good as the best doctor in the world, but probably good enough like an average doctor? So <clears throat> the second thing is, of course, I have a skills issue, right? I still need human beings to interact with the patient. There's no, you know, there are no questions about this, but those skills don't necessarily exist in this form as well. Can we imagine a world where a machine is actually going to teach, not just understand, reason, and learn from all the data that's being produced about cancer or other disease forms, but actually teach and up-ramp the skills, ramp up the skills of community health workers or even medical officers, whatever you kind of systems you have in, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, and create a medical environment that can provide primary care in a much, much better way than what we see today. Now, see, I'm not sure how far we are away 
from this vision. I think we, when, when we look at the first results that we have from cancer treatments uh, from these learning machines, it makes us as a company uh, believe that we enter the era of cognitive computing, that the future of systems is using big data as raw material, using big data as sort of the next natural resource, and create insights not through programmable systems, but through systems that will learn from that big data and provide us insights back to a human being. When we look at Sub-Saharan Africa and also other developing countries, then we see how long can we wait? Should we accelerate these kinds of developments because they may actually address some critical societal problems already? even though they're far from being perfect, even though machine learning and all of these technologies and, 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 and cognitive systems are still in their infancies. But over the next three years, we will see tremendous progress in these things as more and more people are working against these systems, as more and more people are actually joining to train these systems. At Watson alone, we have now already 300 companies who are actually using the Watson information base, which is a trained information base on various different and subject areas, 300 companies that have already launched products worldwide. We see millions of access to our APIs of people who are using the knowledge base and thereby then also start training the knowledge base. So for me, the fascinating thing about what happened over the last 10, 15 years is that we are entering an era where computational systems, we're getting insight, is something that will help us understand and make sense of what it is that we had started to produce 15 years ago. Uh, it's, in my mind, the only way mm -hmm. to go forward. That doesn't mean that you know, we need artificial intelligence to solve every problem in the world. That's not, that's, not the, that's not the issue. There are enough problems that can be solved if we just think hard enough. But in some cases, we have problems where thinking about how to outthink the existing machines that are producing all that data and to make the best out of it could address some of the most critical problems that we have today in, <coughs> in the world. And I want to end on the following note. You know, the, one of the requirements for this is I see cognitive computing and artificial intelligence um, as, of course, it's a, as a scientist, and a computer scientist, uh, I see this is, you know, there's so many interesting research questions that we have to answer. Um, as somebody who's been now working here in Africa for, for the last three years, and I've been in India before that also for three years, um, I feel that around these learning machines, how do we process big data? How do we, how do we make sense of the information that we've so willingly created over the last decade or so um, is almost like a societal movement that I want to see. I want to see society going behind this and understanding that it's not the dystopian future that will arrive. Yes, maybe the robots will at some point take over. That's okay, let them take over. But in the next, in our generation, in our lifetime, the real opportunity is these technologies, with the examples that I just gave you, I think have tremendous, tremendous opportunity to solve some of the most pressing problems of society. And if we don't, as a community of scientists and technologists, don't go behind this and continue to create things just for the thing's sake and for the money's sake, then I believe we're missing out on a huge opportunity. So I appreciate you listening to me. Thank you very much. <laughs>